All right, to this now. On Tuesday last week, the country paused for a moment to honor the memory of Solomon Mahlangu, who was executed by the apartheid state 42 years ago. Mahlangu was hung at the gallows at the then Pretoria Central Prison in 1979, despite spirited international campaigns to spare his life. He had been found guilty of the murder of two white civilians based on the legal principle of common purpose. This even though the man who actually shot the victims, Mahlangu's comrade, Mondi Motloung, had been beaten so badly during his arrest that he was deemed unfit to stand trial. Well, someone who lived through that historic episode is human rights lawyer Ishmael Ayob. He joins me now for a reflection on the life and times of Solomon Mahlangu and lessons that can be drawn for our democracy from there. So, Mr. Ayob, good morning. Thank you for talking to me. I was intrigued when I read the uh, judgment uh, in the matter uh, of Solomon Mahlangu um, and basically the judgment that led to him being executed. But you were there. You lived through it. Just tell me about Solomon Mahlangu as a client, um, a fighting, you know, a legal battle where his life was at stake. This was a young man who was not even 22 years old um, when he was uh, found guilty um, under doctrine of what we call common purpose, that he did no... Um, uh, he committed no murder, um, he shot no one, um, but because he was in the company of Mondi Motlaung, um, who actually did the shooting, and then because Mondi Motlaung was so badly beaten about the, about the head, he was found eventually by three psychiatrists that he could not understand the proceedings, he could not give me instructions. And then Solomon Mashlangu was tried alone uh, for the two murders and further two attempted murders and a whole range of uh, other minor offenses. Uh, he too was beaten. He was beaten about the head. And um, he made a statement to a magistrate late that night, the same day of his arrest. And he said to the magistrate that he had been shot in his ankle. There was a bloodied uh, bandage around his ankle. Uh, he also had a, quite a large um, swelling about, uh, above his head. He told me later that the police had beaten him, but within the context of that statement, uh, before the magistrate where the police were present, he said that he had bumped his head against Mondi. And then he, he made a full confession. Um, but it was clear even during that confession that he was not uh, admitting to shooting anyone at all. He was found a little later in a different room, um, not having fired a single shot. The problem about common, common uh, purpose, even in the democratic South Africa, is that the uh, Constitutional Court has endorsed it. They've endorsed it in a case, I've forgotten the name. I think it's uh, Chabalala, in, in the matter of Chabalala, um, stemming from a group that was involved in a number of rapes uh, in Tembisa in the 90s. Uh, they were sen sentenced in 1999, and the Constitutional Court um, endorsing the doctrine of common purpose even for the crime of rape. But it was uh, specifically for the crime of rape. There's a distinction between Solomon Mashlangu and a gang of rapists who committed the crimes for their own pleasure and benefit. In the case of Solomon Mashlangu, he came there as a liberator. I'm not sure what the Constitutional Court would do today. Um, in the case of Solomon Mashlangu, there, there would be a number of challenges. I can't take them on without having instructions from the family and with the older generations um, who've passed on and with whom I had considerable contact. Um, there is a younger generation and I, ha I don't have much contact or any contact with them at all. But it's something that one can do and see that there should be a distinction 
in the case of a person who is a liberator and a, and, and a person who embarks on a um, gauntlet uh, or, a, uh, uh, or a basis that way he says, I will enjoy my pleasures even if it causes great harm to the, uh, to the victim. So I'm, uh, could you just tell me about Solomon Mashangu during the trial, especially I imagine that there must have been a point where you realized that the likelihood of your client being convicted and sentenced to death uh, was very real. We, we know about the words that are said to have been his last words before he was executed, where he talks about his blood nourishing the tree that will bear the fruits of freedom and telling, uh, tell my people I love them and that they must continue the fight. Do, do those words for you capture the Solomon Masango that you knew uh, during the course of the trial? I saw him after the um, petition to the state president was made, and uh, it was a, a time of great depression um, because he knew that the last attempt to, to keep his life um, was uh, um, about to end. And uh, while I can't just remember the exact words, um, it wasn't a person who says that I'm very sorry that I was there, that uh, I came back to the country to see a freedom that I had never experienced. He had a very hard life. He, he grew up in, in uh, the outskirts of Middleburg, uh, which was Transvaal, and is now in the... Um, uh, and then he, and he, sorry, and he also grew up and schooled in Mamelodi. Uh, his mother was his champion throughout his life. She was a domestic, um, and it was a modest life. He tried to earn a living by selling fruit um, that was confiscated. Um, and then over a period of time, as he grew older, there were people around, young people, who were leaving the country um, and to join the ANC, uh, and then he joined them. Um, there's a long history of his stay w uh, within the training camps uh, between Luanda, Mozambique, um, and his return to South Africa. And uh, in those days, uh, going across the border, uh, there was a little fence uh, for, for very large distances. And uh, the local people had, in most cases, mm. erected little steps on both sides, so you could climb over the uh, um, climb over the fence with comfort. Nobody really cared too much, and that's the way he came back. Uh, on his way back, also um, uh, there were challenges. Yeah. And finally, when he arrived in Johannesburg. That's when the incident took place. So, Mr. Ayob, the reason part of the reason we are reflecting on this, of course, is that. Um, we look to our past to draw lessons for where we are and where we are going. Just looking at the whole conduct of the Solomon Mashangu trial, uh, the arrest and, and you know, the, the, the assaults that happened, uh, the fact that they were beaten um, to a pulp, uh, in the case of Mwende Motlaung, to a point that he was not able to stand trial, uh, the subsequent execution of Solomon Mashangu. What are the lessons for you in terms of how we should be conducting ourselves as a democratic state around issues of justice, um, no matter how much we despise a person, um, you know, no matter how much we think this person is guilty uh, through and through, but also on questions of the death penalty that come up from time to time? The death penalty um, had a profound effect on me and so many others. Um, he was Solomon Mishlang, who was the first liberator who was found um, guilty and um, executed by the apartheid government. There were others who were simply um, found and disappeared, and then, as we know from our history, that um, they were simply executed um, um, uh, extrajudicially. But in the case of Mishlangu, the greatest pressures were put on the government of South Africa, and it resisted. It was the notorious John Foster who was then in, um, uh, in charge, and 
um, there was also the risk that the judge who had a reputation of being the hanging judge uh, presided over the trial. So it was also a difficult period that um, the very best we did, um, uh, Ishmael Mohammed, the uh, later chief justice, was the senior counsel, and he tried everything possible, but failed. In the, uh, in the democratic South Africa, one great liberating force is that the death penalty has been abolished. It's a, it's a mark of its civilization. I am grateful, but uh, the life that we live today, despite all its challenges, it means that if you're going from point A to point B within a city, no policeman will come along and say, where's your pass? And then you are all chained together uh, by handcuffs and 10 or 20 uh, men, always men and African men wearing suits and hats are bundled into a police van uh, and then taken away. Their, their crime, they happen not to have their pass in, uh, in their uh, possession and uh, would be sentenced for a few weeks at a time. It was a terrible state, and it, and it, it uh, uh, went right across the board. Yeah. The Bantustans were created there, that, um, that the greater part of South Africa's citizens were stripped of their rights here and to live in, in cities. Everything was for the uh, liberation and for the exclusive use of whites. There's a small thing that I've noticed um, just last week. I went to the magistrate's court and I found that the floors were polished uh, to a beautiful level. And there were African women who were attending to the cleaning. In those days, and in the days of Mashlangu, this was an exclusive task of white men. You went to court and there were white men cleaning the floors. That was reserved employment to that extent. Hmm. If you ended up in John Foster Square, as Solomon did, there was a terrible fear with every family member and friend and acquaintance that would they ever come down from that death floor. Yeah. All right, Mr. Ismail. In I, one sense. Unfo unfortunately, I'm completely out of time. I really appreciate your reflections uh, on the life and times of Solomon Mashlang uh, from first hand experience, lived experience, and some of those um, freedoms uh, that we should treasure. Of course, April is also Freedom Month. Uh, that's human rights lawyer there, Ismail Ayob, uh, joining me there in a conversation about Solomon Mashlang, just his personal reflections of representing him.